I'm sure many of you are familiar with the film The Candyman, but what you may be unaware of is that there is a real-life Candyman serial killer. While the two really only share their name in common, the real-life Candyman story and crimes are so appalling and heartbreaking, you'll wish they were only a movie. Today, we'll be examining the life, legacy, and downfall of Dean Coral, Texas's own Candyman. Born in Fort Wayne, Indiana on December 24, 1939, Dean Coral was the oldest of two boys. His parents were Mary and Arnold Coral, and while his parents were never abusive or violent, the house certainly was tense and filled with arguing. While Arnold was strict with the children and valued hard discipline, Mary was very overprotective of her two sons. This difference led to many, many fights and arguments until 1946, four years after the birth of their second son, Stanley, Mary and Arnold decided to get a divorce. Not long after the divorce, Arnold was drafted into the Air Force and sent to a base in Tennessee, and Mary followed him there, selling their house and moving in an effort to keep the children near their father, regardless of her feelings towards him. By 1950, Mary and Arnold had made up and decided to get remarried, once again uprooting their kids and moving them to Pasadena, Texas. Unfortunately, once again in 1953, the two of them decided to get divorced again, with Mary having custody over the children again. Dean and Stanley had no stability in their young childhoods, with their parents' marriage constantly fluctuating and being forced to move every few years, preventing them from making lasting friends. In 1955, Mary eventually remarried to a man named Jake West, who was a traveling clock salesman, and the two of them had a daughter while living in Texas. They eventually decided to start a candy company together, which they called Pecan Prince. Dean and his younger brother Stanley both worked in their family's company constantly when they were younger, being mainly in charge of operating the candy-making machinery, which also kept them from being able to appreciate and experience their childhoods. Dean was a shy and quiet kid who mostly kept to himself, and he unfortunately spent most of his younger years being incredibly sick. At age 7, he contracted rheumatic fever, but it somehow went undetected and untreated until he was 11 years old when doctors discovered he had a heart murmur. When he was older and in high school, Dean was still considered solitary and was overall an average student in terms of grades and behavior. His only real passion in high school seemed to be the brass band for which he played trombone, but after graduating in 1958, Dean dropped that passion. By the time Dean graduated, the Pecan Prince Candy Company was beginning to expand, and he moved with the rest of his family to Houston, Texas. However, two years later, in 1962, Dean would move back to his birthplace of Indiana to live for a while with his widowed grandmother. While in Indiana, Dean actually entered a relationship with a woman who would eventually propose to him. However, he rejected her and moved back to Texas to help with the family business. In 1963, Jake and Mary got divorced, and Mary made her own rival candy company to the Pecan Prince, simply called the Coral Candy Company, with Dean actually becoming the vice president. It was during this time period that Mary chose to fire a teenage boy that had been making complaints over Dean making sexual advances towards him. Unfortunately, this would become a running theme for teen boys that worked for the candy company. In August of the following year, Dean would get drafted into the military and sent out of Texas for basic training before eventually coming back to Texas to be permanently stationed at Fort Hood. It was in the military that Dean would realize he was homosexual and have his first gay encounters. However, of the few close acquaintances he told, most of them had already suspected he was gay due to the way he acted around teenage boys, which was alarming to say the least. Despite the self-discovery he experienced in the military, Dean reportedly hated serving and got honorably discharged on June 11, 1965 and went back home to help out with the candy company. Later, in 1965, the company moved to Houston Heights across from an elementary school, and Dean was known to give out free candy to the local kids, especially teen boys, earning himself the nicknames The Candyman and The Pied Piper. Dean was a lot less subtle with the way he would come on to any of the teenage male employees, and even set up a pool table in the back of the factory where teen employees and local kids would gather and hang out. Two years passed, and in 1967, Dean became friends with a 12-year-old boy named David Brooks. David came from a broken home with divorced parents, and as he traveled to visit his two parents, he also made sure to stop by and stay at Dean's apartment, which he had begun to consider a second home. Whenever Brooks was also in need of cash, Dean always provided, which led David to viewing Dean as a real father figure. Tragically, Dean had been grooming the younger boy, and by 1969, after Dean urged for a while, he convinced David to let Dean perform oral sex on him in exchange for cash or gifts. By this point, the Coral Candy Company had shut down, and both Mary and Dean's stepsister moved to Colorado, and while they would still talk with Dean on the phone, neither of them would ever see Dean alive again. 
A year after their relationship turned sexual, David walked into Dean's apartment only to see him assaulting two teenage boys, but Dean was able to buy David silence by offering him a car. Then Dean made a terrible deal with David. Dean convinced David to help him lure victims to the apartment by promising to pay David for his work, and David agreed. Their first victim was an 18-year-old named Jeffrey Conan, who disappeared while hitchhiking home where he was believed to be picked up by Dean and David and taken back to the apartment. While trapped in the apartment, Conan was brutally assaulted, tortured, and eventually strangled to death. This same year, David also helped Dean lure two other boys, 14-year-old James Glass and Danny Yates, away from a religious rally and to Dean's apartment, where they fell to the same fate as Jeffrey Conan. On January 30th, 1971, Dean and David kidnapped 13- and 15-year-old brothers Donald and Jerry Waldrop while they were on their way home. Then, from March to May of that same year, Dean also used David's help to kill 15-year-old Randall Harvey, 13-year-old David Hillegeist, and 16-year-old Gregory Winkle. David was also even willing to lure his own friends to their demise at the hands of Dean and his buddy, a 17-year-old Reuben Watson Haney, who had been lured back to Dean's apartment under the guise of attending a party. In the fall of 1971, David lured an unknown number of young boys to the apartment, where they were kept trapped and alive for four whole days before being killed. At the end of this same year, David brought over a friend named Elmer Wayne Henley, likely so he too could be killed by Dean. However, Dean ended up taking a liking to Wayne and offered him the same deal he had made with David well over a year earlier at this point. Dean somewhat hid his true intentions from Wayne, however, and instead of telling him outright about the murders, instead told Wayne that he was involved in a white slavery ring. Wayne later claimed that he rejected Dean's offer for months until the early months of 1972 when his family came on hard times and were in desperate need of money. On February 9, 1972, a 17-year-old Willard Branch Jr. went missing and is believed to be Wayne's first lure back to the apartment. A month later, Wayne brings one of his friends, an 18-year-old boy named Frank Aguirre, over to Dean's apartment to smoke some weed. Before either of the boys could react, however, Dean accosted Frank and handcuffed both of his hands behind his back before David helped gag Frank. Wayne claimed that he asked Dean to let Frank go, but Dean refused and told Wayne about what he had done to the previous victim Wayne had brought and how he intended to do the same thing to Frank. At this, Wayne let Dean continue and later helped Dean and David bury the body at High Island Beach. From 1972 to 1973, Dean, David, and Wayne sexually assaulted, tortured, and strangled 17 other boys. This murder spree would finally come to a close in the latter half of 1973, three years after the killings initially began. On the night of August 7, 1973, Wayne, who was 17 years old by this point, brought a 19-year-old boy named Timothy Curlisle to Dean's apartment, as well as another friend, a 15-year-old girl named Rhonda Williams. Curl was infuriated that Wayne would bring a girl into his apartment, telling Wayne that he had apparently ruined everything. Wayne explained that she had an issue with her family and didn't want to go back home and Dean appeared to calm down, and even offered the kids alcohol and weed. And around two hours later, all three of the teens had passed out. Wayne then got a rude start when he awoke to find that Dean had gagged and handcuffed all three of the teenagers. Dean reiterated to Wayne how furious he was over Wayne bringing a girl into the apartment, but Wayne was able to convince Dean to free him so that he could also participate in the torture and murder. Dean instructs Wayne to sexually assault and kill Rhonda while he dealt with Timothy. Wayne walks over to Rhonda, who asked him, is this for real? To which Wayne responded, yes, before Rhonda asked him, are you going to do anything about it? Something about this struck a nerve with Wayne, and he grabbed Dean's pistol and threatened to shoot him, saying that this had all gone too far. Dean egged him on, saying that Wayne wouldn't shoot him right before he got shot six times, ultimately killing him and ending one of the worst cases of serial murder in American history. The three teens contacted the police shortly thereafter, and Wayne was placed under arrest, with David Brooks' arrest following soon after. Wayne gave a full in-depth confession to the police and even led them to the body dumping sites where the police would end up recovering 28 bodies. Wayne and David were tried separately from each other, with Wayne getting charged on six counts of murder and David only getting actually charged with the murder of one person, a teenager named William Lawrence. While Wayne is still alive and serving his sentence at a Texas prison, David recently died in 2021 due to complications with COVID-19. Dean Coral is responsible for one of the most heinous and disturbing killing sprees in American history and serves as the blueprint for the warnings to children to not accept free candy from strangers in vans. Thankfully though, his murderous reign has ended and this case can be closed. Tell us your thoughts about this case in the comment section below and let us know any other stories you'd like us to cover. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe as that helps us produce more videos like this one, and we'll see you in the next one.